Good afternoon. Um, I will start with the usual update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,682 positive cases confirmed through our NHS labs. That's an increase of 17 from yesterday. A total of 909 patients are in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a total decrease of 78 since yesterday, including a decrease of 10 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 21 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is an increase of three since yesterday, but all of the increase, I should say, is in suspected cases. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,858 patients who had tested positive and needed hospital treatment for the virus have been able to leave hospital, and I wish all of them well. And in the past 24 hours, five deaths were registered of patients confirmed through a test as having the virus. Uh, the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement is now therefore 2,439. As always, uh, it's important to stress that the figures I've just read out uh, are not just statistics. They all represent individuals uh, who right now are being mourned by their families and friends. So again, I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this illness. I also want to express my thanks, as always, to our health and care workers for the extraordinary work that they continue to do in very difficult and testing circumstances. Now, I want to highlight three issues today. Uh, firstly, I will uh, cover our latest report, which has just been published on the R number. I will update on some developments in the construction industry and talk about support that we're making available for students over the summer. I'll then close by reflecting on the importance of our test and protect system, which was launched two weeks ago, and our wider public health guidance. Uh, let me start, though, with today's report on the R number. As uh, you will recall, the R number shows the rate at which this virus is reproducing. So in summary, if R is above one, every person with the virus will infect more than one other person and the virus will then spread exponentially. If R, though, is below one, uh, the number of people with the virus will fall. Uh, we estimate that the R number in Scotland as of last Friday, the 5th of June, was between 0.6 and 0.8. That is a lower estimate than for two weeks ago when we calculated that the number was likely to be between 0.7 and 0.9. So under that estimate, we expect that the virus will continue to decline. In addition, uh, we estimate that last Friday, 4,500 people in Scotland had the virus and were infectious. Uh, our previous estimate for the 29th of May had been that 11,500 people uh, were likely to be infectious. Now, that, of course, sounds like a very big decline, so it's worth uh, me stressing that we don't actually think the number of infectious people has more than halved in just one week. Uh, what has been happening is that we have uh, been reassessing our estimates for previous weeks based on the latest figures uh, available to us. So in, in short, it's likely that the 11,500 was an overestimate, uh, not that the number has halved uh, in a single week. Uh, however, notwithstanding that, these latest estimates reflect the encouraging data that we have seen in the last couple of weeks. And there is no doubt looking at all of this data uh, that we are making very real progress in combating and suppressing the virus in Scotland. However, as always, it's important that I inject a note of caution. Uh, firstly, uh, the estimates that I have reported to you today, uh, of course, don't yet take account of the phase one changes that we made uh, to begin the easing out of lockdown, and we need to continue to monitor any impact from that carefully. Um, and secondly, the number of people who we estimate will be infectious is certainly smaller than it was but it is also still large enough to make uh, the virus uh, take off rapidly again if the R number was to go uh, much above one. Uh, so for these reasons, uh, we need to uh, celebrate the progress, uh, but continue to be careful and cautious. Next week, uh, in fact, uh, a week today, we will have a further review of the lockdown restrictions. 
I am currently very hopeful that at that point we will be able to lift some further restrictions. We may not be able to do everything uh, in phase two, but I hope that we can do uh, certainly at least some of that. Of course, it is also possible that some of these changes will be phased over uh, a three-week period. Uh, but I'm hopeful that we will be able to take some further important steps forward when we report on the review next week. But it is important, again, to stress that we must do that cautiously and proportionately. Um, and uh, I will also make the point I, I frequently make, but it is uh, not just an obvious point, it's a very important point. We will be in a better position to lift more restrictions if all of us continue to stick with the current guidelines and further suppress the virus uh, to lower levels uh, than it is even now. Now, one area where we judge we can make some further progress now um, is in the construction industry. I can confirm today that the sector will be able to move to the next step of its restart plan, which is something that was always envisaged as part of phase one of a route map. So it's not a change to phase one. Earlier steps have allowed for health and safety planning, followed by preparatory work at construction sites. And moving to the next step of the industry plan will now allow workers to return to construction construction sites gradually uh, while using measures such as physical distancing and hand hygiene to ensure that they can do so safely. Um, I'm very grateful to the sector and to trade unions for the very responsible approach that they have taken during an incredibly difficult time. Um, it's important to uh, be very clear though that we still have a long way to go before construction will be working at full capacity but there's no doubt this is a significant step in allowing an important industry to return safely to work. I can also confirm today that we are extending our help to buy scheme, which was due to come to an end uh, next March. Uh, we're extending that to March 2022. Under that scheme, the government provides up to 15% of the cost of buying a new build home and recovers its share of the funding when the property is sold or when the share is bought out. In recent years, this scheme has helped 17,000 people, more than three quarters of them aged 35 or under, to buy new build homes. It has also, of course, been a valuable support for house builders. At present, of course, the pandemic means that the scheme is not being used. So by confirming that it is being extended, I hope we can ensure that more people who may otherwise have missed out on this scheme are able to move into new homes in the future. Uh, and also uh, that we are able to provide a bit more confidence for the construction sector. The third issue I want to talk about is support for students. Um, we know that many students rely on income from seasonal or part-time jobs, especially over the summer months, and that the economic impact of COVID uh, will therefore cause them particular difficulties. And that can be especially important for higher education students who, unlike further education students, can't usually claim benefits over the summer. We've already provided additional support for students and we've also suspended debt recovery action by the Students Awards Agency. Uh, and today we're bringing forward more than £11 million of further support. This funding will be administered by colleges and universities to help higher education students who most need it. And it's a further way in which we're trying to support students at a time when we know many of them are still facing uh, potential hardship. Now, the final issue I want to cover today relates to my earlier discussion of the R number and how we hope next week to announce some further changes to lockdown restrictions. As we do that, as we gradually, and I emphasise gradually, return to meeting more people and living a bit more freely, which all of us are, of course, keen to do, our test and protect system will become ever more important in helping us all to live a less restricted life while still being able to suppress the virus. Now, yesterday we published the first data uh, from the system, uh, which started two weeks ago today. And that data shows that in the period up to the 7th of June, 681 people who reported symptoms uh, had tested positive for COVID. As of yesterday, contact tracing had been completed for 481 of those and was in progress for a further 50. Amongst those 531 cases, a total of 741 contacts had been traced. That's just under one and a half people per case. Uh, and of course, people's contacts right now will be lower than normal because of the lockdown restrictions that are in place. Now, there's two points that I think it's important for me to note about this data. It is very initial data. Uh, the first is that the number of people who've tested positive is higher than is suggested by our daily figures, the ones I report on new cases here each day. 
That's because our daily figures don't yet cover tests from labs run by the UK government, such as those for regional test centres and mobile units, although we will be able to include that information very soon. In addition, the current figures uh, slightly overstate the number of cases where no tracing has been carried out so far. Uh, one reason for that is that some historic cases from the time when the system was being piloted still feature in the data. And if that historic data is removed, the proportion of completed cases increases from 71% to 86%. We will publish more detailed data on Test and Protect in the weeks ahead because it's important not just that government understands how well it is working, but you, the public, can see that too. But I want to be very clear that our preliminary indications are that Test and Protect is already working well. Uh, and of course, we will identify areas for improvement as and when they arise and as the system becomes ever more established. Fundamentally, though, I want to stress to everyone watching just how important Test and Protect is and how important it is going to continue to be in the weeks and potentially the months that lie ahead. I guess it essentially represents for all of us a kind of social bargain. Uh, if you have symptoms or, and in some ways actually this is the much more difficult bit, if you have been in contact with someone who has symptoms, even if you don't have symptoms yourself, we will ask you to isolate completely. We'll support you in doing that if you need that support, but it is still a very tough thing to ask people to do. However, uh, and this is the, the social bargain bit, if all of us agree to do that when necessary, it means that all of us together, collectively, will be able to continue to emerge from lockdown while keeping the virus under control. At any one time, some of us will have to self-isolate for a period so that together, all of us can start to lead a less restricted life. So please, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, uh, remember that's a new continuous cough or, or a fever or a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. Please do not wait for a few hours or a day or two to see if you feel better. Start self-isolating immediately that you experience these symptoms and ask for a test immediately. And uh, to remind you, you can do that by going to the NHS Inform website or by phoning NHS 24 on 0800 028 2816. That's 0800 028 2816. If we all do that uh, when we experience symptoms and if any of us who are uh, contacted to say we've been in uh, close contact with someone uh, who has the virus uh, and we agree to self-isolate, then all of us are going to uh, help enable the whole country to get out of lockdown not just a bit more quickly, but more safely as well. Final point I want to make before we move on to questions is that your best way of reducing, the best way of all of us to reduce our chance of being a close contact of somebody with the virus and being asked to self-isolate as a result is by continuing to stick to the key public health guidance. Um, and of course, that is also our best way of avoiding getting and transmitting the virus. So just to remind everybody what that guidance is, you should still be staying at home most of the time right now, and you should still be meeting fewer people than you normally would. If your life feels like it is getting back to normal right now, please ask yourself why that is, because it shouldn't yet be feeling as if it is getting back to normal. When you do meet people from another household, you absolutely must stay outdoors. Do not go indoors and you must stay two metres apart from members of the other household. Please do not meet up with more than one other household at a time. Don't meet more than one in the course of any uh, single day. And please keep to a maximum, I stress a maximum, of eight people in any group. Wash your hands often, make sure you're doing it thoroughly. If you're out of your home, take hand sanitizer with you. Wear a face covering if you are in an enclosed space where physical distancing may be more difficult, for example, in a shop or in public transport. Uh, again, I want to stress that. Uh, we know that one of us wearing a face covering helps uh, reduce the risk of us transmitting the virus to somebody else, and somebody else wearing a face covering reduces the risk of them transmitting the virus to us. It's another way in which we can all act to protect each other. Avoid touching hard surfaces and any you do touch, make sure you're cleaning them thoroughly. And as I've already covered today, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, ask for a test immediately and please follow 
the advice on self-isolation. Um, above all else, uh, all of us right now should remember that in every single individual decision we take, we are potentially affecting the health and the well-being of others and indeed the well-being of the whole country. So if all of us continue to do the right thing, if all of us continue to stick to these rules, then we will continue to see the progress that I have been reporting in recent days and we will be able to come out of lockdown uh, hopefully even uh, more quickly, but much more importantly than that, we will be able to do that sustainably because we will come out of lockdown and continue to suppress this virus, which is our overall aim. So thank you for everything you've been doing. Uh, please keep doing it so that together we can continue to make this life-saving progress. Uh, thank you very much for being with me today. Um, I'm joined, uh, of course, as uh, usual, by uh, the Chief Medical Officer and by the Health Secretary, who will uh, help me with answering the questions. But we are now going to go straight uh, to questions. We've got a, a large number of questions today. We will get through all of them. Uh, and the first one today comes from Glenn Campbell from BBC Scotland. Okay, so from Saturday, single adult households in England will be able to form a support bubble with one other household. Are you planning to do anything like this, and if so, when? And one brief extra question to you and the Chief Medical Officer, is the two-metre rule a fixed rule in Scotland? Um, on, on the first of your question, um, we are considering uh, moving to phase two a week today, which is our next uh, review date. And I, I think it's really important, I, I feel very strongly about this, that if we are to come out of lockdown at the right pace, and in a way that is sustainable and doesn't risk the virus running out of control and us having to go backwards, we stick to our plan and we do things in a very uh, methodical uh, way, stick to our review timetables, make sure we are assessing all of the evidence and taking careful and well-founded decisions. And that's what we're going to continue to do, not uh, come here every day and announce different uh, moves out of lockdown uh, at these briefings. So I'm going to stick to uh, that very planned way of doing it. And we will be considering all of the things that are in phase two, which of course includes uh, greater social interaction uh, for individuals. I, I want to get people able to see more of their families and friends. Uh, we've uh, had questions here before, for example, um, about couples who uh, live apart. These are particularly difficult times for people in, in these circumstances, for people who live alone, uh, also very difficult. So we want to move to greater normality as quickly as possible. But uh, we don't do anybody any favours. I will not do anybody any favours by taking these decisions in anything other than a well thought out, well planned way, uh, or by trying to move too quickly, because then we risk having to go backwards. So we'll set out next uh, Thursday whether and to what extent we can go into phase two. And as I've said before, I'm optimistic on the basis of the data as it is right now, but we'll all increase the, the, the possibility and the likelihood of being able to ease more restrictions if we all stick to these rules for now. Um, I'll hand over to Gregor in a second on uh, two metres. Uh, we, we look at the evidence and uh, we'll, we'll consider the evidence in all of these aspects on an ongoing basis. Right now, the evidence I have, the advice I have, is that we shouldn't change the two metre rule. Um, that doesn't mean I will close my mind to it in future. I think it's really important to emphasise that they, this is not an absolute discussion. Uh, just as it's not the case that there is no risk of transmission at two metres, you know, there would be less risk of transmission if it was three metres or, uh, or four metres, it is the case that there is greater risk of transmission at one metre than there is at two metres. So this is about relative risk. It's not about saying there is a particular distance that is absolutely safe. And it's often a trade-off. So if you go for a, a shorter distance, there are other things you would have to do potentially to mitigate that. Some of the countries that follow a one metre or a one and a half metre rule have much, much stricter uh, requirements in place for face coverings. And in fact, some of these countries, particularly Asian countries, have a very different culture around face coverings. There may also be a trade-off in terms of time. Right now, we say that uh, you know the, the risk is, is minimal if you're two metres away from somebody for no more than 15 minutes. If that goes to one metre, that time consideration may be different. Uh, and my last point, before I hand over to Gregor, is that some of the emerging evidence around how and where this virus most transmits, uh, the, the kind, I was talking about this yesterday, I think, around the K number, uh, the, the uh, evidence around super spreading uh, events or, or settings, clusters of this virus, could suggest that 
uh, the, the kind of settings where reducing two metres may deliver practical benefits may also be the kind of settings in which the risk of transmission is greater. So that's a very long-winded way of saying this is not a straightforward calculation. There's lots of different things we've got to consider and we've got to consider them carefully. Uh, but right now, the advice given to me is that we shouldn't change two metres, but we will continue to listen to uh, advice if it changes and consider the evidence on an ongoing basis. Gregor. So the risk that's associated with distancing is a continuum. Um, physical contact is probably the greatest risk. At one metre, you start to reduce that risk, but at two metres, you reduce that risk even further. And the evidence around about this has been considered as recently as last week by, by, by SAGE again. And what those experts have advised is that the, uh, the, the degree of risk starts to increase between one and two metres by between two and ten times, depending where your location is in relation to the person that you're standing beside. So at this moment in time, the, the absolute guidance in Scotland is that we should remain with the recommendation that um, people keep two metres, a minimum of two metres distance uh, between each other. Now, that's right for the, this point in time in the epidemic. It's, it's possible that we will review that in the future um, and, and come to another conclusion. But the evidence at this moment in time for the situation that we find ourselves in just now is certainly that the two metre guidance should remain. Thanks, very good. Ross Govins from STV. Afternoon, First Minister. Uh, nearly 630,000 people in Scotland have been furloughed. Many must be watching the almost daily job losses seemingly across all sectors, wondering are they next? Is there a real danger many of those in furlough will not return to their jobs? Um, well, my, um, my objective is to manage our way through this pandemic um, in a, a manner that suppresses the virus and doesn't uh, lead to a risk of a resurgent virus, which will take us back the way and do even greater damage and probably undoubtedly actually more long-lasting damage to the economy than even what we see right now, while at the same time uh, making sure that we can open up our economy again to get businesses operating and uh, earning money again so that they can preserve jobs uh, and not face the, the prospect of making people redundant. As I've said right throughout this, that is not an easy balance to strike, but it is the balance that we have to strike to the best of our ability. Uh, we need to make sure that as we, we, we go through that careful, inevitably and unavoidably gradual process, there is support in place for companies. And uh, we will continue to talk to the UK government about making sure that the furlough scheme, for example, is not ended prematurely before we uh, are in a position of enabling businesses to open up again. And some other countries uh, have already uh, announced much more extensive uh, Sort of arrangements in terms of, of job support and, and wage support schemes. So we will continue to have these discussions with the UK government. We will continue to look at the support uh, arrangements that we can put in place here in Scotland. But this is about, um, and I, I think it's really, really important that while I understand that, particularly if you're an employer facing, you know, horrendously difficult times and facing horrible decisions about uh, those who work for you, and if you're somebody working for a firm that is facing difficulties and, and worrying about redundancy. I understand that it can be very easy to see this as a trade-off between what we need to do to tackle the virus and what we need to do to protect the economy. But we can't see it as a trade-off like that. We've got to get both of these things in sync because if we act too quickly on uh, easing lockdown and the virus runs out of control again, then that will do more damage to the economy. Equally, if we go more slowly uh, than it is necessary, then that would do unnecessary damage to the economy. So getting all of these decisions uh, taken at the right pace with the right interdependencies is, is vital. And that's why, going back to my answer to Glenn, I'm determined uh, to do this in a methodical and planned way. We've got our three weekly cycles. We look at the evidence very carefully. We take balanced decisions. Uh, we're trying to give the tourism sector, for example, the ability to plan ahead. So the announcement yesterday that all being equal and all going well, we would see a reopening of the tourist sector in uh, mid-July from the 15th of July gives that sector that is dependent on advanced bookings a bit more clarity and ability to plan. Uh, so we'll do that as far as possible, but we have to keep the virus under control. I can't stress that enough. If this virus runs out of control again, then we're all back to square one. More people will die and the economy will suffer more damage. So, you know, these are the, the daily 
judgments and balances we've got to continue to strike and we will continue to do that to the very best of our ability. Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Could I just pick up on uh, that remark you made just at the end there um, about uh, tourism and <coughs> the date of it getting back to some kind of normality on the 15th of July? Uh, Rachel Hamilton, a spokesperson for the Scottish Conservatives, says that this move is, and I quote, too little and too late. How do you respond to that? Um, I should explain that I've just choked on some water. I'm not coughing for any other reason uh, right now. Um, I would respond to that, I suppose, pretty straightforwardly. Um, I don't know what Rachel Hamilton thinks we should have done. Take precipitate action uh, to open up sectors of our economy while we still judge that that poses a risk of the virus running out of control. Not only would that be reckless and irresponsible in terms of what should be the primary duty of any government to try to uh, preserve people's health and life, uh, but it also wouldn't have been doing any favours to the economy or, or the tourist sector of the economy. So it's very easy for uh, opposition politicians, and I've been an opposition politician, so that I'm not trying to be particularly critical here. It's, it's in the nature of it, although you hope at times like this people would rise above it. Uh, but it, it's very easy for politicians to say uh, that whatever we decide to do, that it's the wrong thing or it's too little, too late. And I'm sure if we did something else, they would say that as well. These are difficult decisions. Um, I want to get the economy going as quickly as possible. It's not in the Scottish Government's interest to see the economy close down for a minute longer than it has to be. But I'm not prepared to take decisions that I would be taking knowing that we were putting lives unnecessarily at risk. So uh, my job is to take the decisions and, you know, uh, that's a responsibility I take seriously. The opposition's job absolutely is to scrutinise that and I have no complaints about that. But I hope everybody in a time of severe crisis like this will understand that none of these decisions are easy or straightforward. They all involve difficult judgments and difficult balances and we are trying to get it as right as possible in the interests of human health and life and in the interests of the economy too. And, and I hope we can move forward on that basis. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. The, the COVID committee yesterday had some pretty worrying evidence from Inclusion Scotland about the number of disabled people who have been pushed to the brink mentally as a result of lockdown. And they say that many of them have this fear of being abandoned due to the withdrawal of some support services. So what would be your message to those disabled Scots who are feeling abandoned? And Inclusion Scott would also say that um, there are disabled people who are at a high risk but not in the shielding group and don't have the same access to government help as provided to those in the shielding group. And they're looking for uh, tailored and, and specific uh, advice. Is the Scottish Government looking to provide that advice to them? Let me make a few general comments. I'm, I'm going to hand over to the Health Secretary who may want to say uh, something uh, more specifically about this, but we, we listened very carefully to what uh, Inclusion Scotland had to say yesterday. And I suppose there's a, a couple of points I want to make. The first one is I don't want anybody across Scotland to feel abandoned and I will do everything in my power every single day to make sure that nobody is abandoned or nobody feels abandoned. And, and where uh, we're failing in that at any point, we will try to redouble our efforts to, to address that. And that will be certainly the case uh, as we look at and try to respond to the comments that were made uh, yesterday. We, we know, I, I've said many times and others have said, we're all in this together. And at a very basic level, that is true. But that kind of statement masks the reality that for many people, this is a, a much more difficult experience than it is for others because of their particular circumstances. And we should never forget that. Um, I, I suspect there is not a single person in the country that doesn't find aspects of this a struggle and that doesn't find that there has been an impact on their mental health. And I, I mean that quite literally, not probably a single person. But we know that impact will be greater on those who came into this crisis with uh, with real challenges and, and that will include people with with disabilities and we've got to recognize that in our response and we have as we've reported here uh, may, on many occasions we've made funding and support available to different organizations to try to increase the ability they have to support people in particular circumstances and we'll continue to look at how we do that my final point would be on the shielded um, issue you raised it's uh, medical advisors, chief medical officers who uh, give advice on who should be in the shielded category. That's not for you know people like me to 
to decide because these are clinical decisions. Mm -hmm. But at a much earlier stage, of course, we put in place a helpline for vulnerable people who are not in the shielded category. And I, I don't have the number in front of me right now and don't want to try and give it from memory in case I get it wrong, but we'll put that number out on the Scottish Government Twitter uh, account this afternoon just to remind people that there is help for people who feel vulnerable and, and are vulnerable, even if they're not in the shielded category. And I want people to be very aware of that. But I'll hand over to the Health Secretary who might want to say a word or two more. Thanks very much. Um, we are paying very careful attention to the evidence that Inclusion, uh, Inclusion Scotland gave yesterday. Uh, we have a, a long track record of working very closely with Inclusion Scotland on these matters and of them uh, directly helping and advising us. So if there is more that they think that we should be doing, then I will pay very close attention to that. We have put in place, as the First Minister said, a range of support services. We've put in place uh, additional funding to ensure that uh, support packages for individuals via local authorities uh, are, are not reduced uh, as local authorities have to scale up the work that they are doing to support other individuals requiring support shorter, longer term as a consequence of the virus. And we've, we've put in place some additional uh, support in terms of PPE, for example, for personal assistance and unpaid carers because those issues were raised with us and we understood how important they were. So uh, I am very open to uh, discussing more with Inclusion uh, Scotland what more they think we could usefully do, uh, as well as making sure that the supports that are there, that people know that, uh, and that they and the Glasgow Disability Alliance and other organisations are helped to promote the support that is there, uh, as well as look at what additional support might be particularly needed, if any, for people's mental health and well-being. So we will continue to look at these matters because this group of people, like other groups of people, are really important to us. Uh, thank you. Jack Foster from Global. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Just picking up on the issue of potential job losses again, uh, which obviously seems particularly relevant today with these announcements from the likes of Centrica and McDonald Hotels, You've said that you're committed to protecting the economy as a whole, obviously, but what reassurance can you give to people across Scotland who are looking at these announcements and feeling like it could be the tip of the iceberg? And is there any reason why thousands of Scots shouldn't be, quite frankly, scared of what lies ahead for the economy, for their livelihoods, and in many cases, the ability to put food on the table? Well, I mean, it's an important uh, question. It's an important way of asking the question, so let me try and uh, address it directly. I mean, firstly, politicians like me often talk about supporting the economy and, and supporting business. What we actually mean fundamentally when we talk about that is supporting people's jobs and livelihoods, because if we support the economy, we support the ability of businesses to employ people and, and sustain people in employment. So this is all about protecting jobs and uh, preventing, as far as we can, the, the loss of jobs and, and the redundancy situations that we are uh, hearing about day in and day out and that will be an iron uh, laser focus from uh, this government working of course with the UK government who still hold many of the uh, economic levers uh, every single day as we, we move uh, through the, the different phases of this crisis. And on your question about how people should feel, um, I, I'm not going to stand here and, and you know suggest to anybody that this is not a deeply worrying uh, period that we are living through. Uh, people feel anxious about their health uh, and people feel very anxious about the implications for how we're dealing with a, a potentially deadly virus for their, their living standards and, and their livelihoods in future. And you know, I, I can't uh, stand here and take away all of that anxiety for people. What I can do and what I've tried to do every single day of this crisis is to make clear that we are doing everything as a government that we reasonably can, firstly to steer the country through the health crisis, but also to do everything we can to mitigate the economic crisis. And as I've said before, and I won't repeat it all, the two are inextricably linked. Um, and that focus and that determination will continue for every day that it is required. I think inevitably, as hopefully we continue to see the immediate impact of the virus recede more and more of what you will hear me and colleagues talking about from uh, these platforms in the weeks ahead will be what we're doing to support the economy and jobs and that is absolutely right and proper but I want to assure people uh, that this has 
uh, the absolute focus and attention of me and the government, and it will continue to do so every single day that we are living through this crisis and all of the consequences of the crisis that, unfortunately, are likely to be with us for some time to come. And all of it, in an economic sense, is about protecting jobs uh, and protecting economic activity. Um, and within that, protecting the groups that we know are likely to be most uh, seriously affected. We know from previous recessions and economic downturns that it's often younger people uh, and people who are already quite far away from the labour market who bear the biggest burden of that. And that is very much in our sights as we try to map our way through the economic aspects of what is an, an incredibly difficult time for everybody. Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, First Minister, and good afternoon. Um, according to the government's figures published last night, there have been just over 18,000 care home workers in Scotland tested for the coronavirus so far, um, which leaves about 35,000 yet to be tested. Uh, Sir Donald McCaskill said yesterday that your plan for routine testing was still some way off, um, and the actual number of tests seem to be stagnating, and there's a huge gulf between actual tests and testing capacity. I was wondering, given the, the tragic situation the sector's experienced, do you concern that there's not enough urgency in getting care home staff tested? I'll hand over to the Health Secretary, but I, I think she and I have uh, made very clear we want to see uh, progress accelerate, which is why the Health Secretary has been very clear and very direct with health boards. And part of the reason we're uh, publishing data, uh, the initial data was published yesterday, it will now be published weekly, is so that people can see the progress that is being made. But as I've also made clear, this is not a one-off exercise. This is something that is going to be done uh, regularly and routinely. And therefore, it is important, even if it, you know, to the frustration of all of us sometimes, takes a bit longer to get operational. It's important that it is uh, operationalised in a very robust way because we need it to be sustainable. And that's what health boards are, are putting in place. Of course, the figures uh, that you refer to uh, are, are actually higher than we thought yesterday because there was a, a figure that was wrongly uh, reported yesterday. But there is still a way to go. But, you know, we will also be, uh, in all likelihood, moving to routinely test other groups of the population as well, uh, healthcare workers in addition to social care workers, and we'll take decisions on that shortly. Um, I, I would simply caution a little bit about looking at overall testing figures, um, which is perfectly legitimate to do, but as you do that, to, to understand that underneath those headline figures, uh, there will be a bit of change, because as which will hopefully continue to be the case, the prevalence of the virus reduces. We hope there will be fewer people coming forward for testing because they have symptoms, because there will be fewer people, we hope, with symptoms. Um, but we want to see the, the, the strands of testing that are about routine, regular testing of people, whether they have symptoms or, or not, increase. Um, so there'll be, underneath those headlines, uh, changes in the different strands of uh, our testing approach. Uh, I hand over to Jean, particularly on uh, care homes. Thanks very much, First Minister. And just to follow on from uh, the point that you ended on, as we see the additional measures that we've introduced for care homes, including uh, that additional clinical support in terms of uh, staffing, the use of PPE, infection prevention and control, then I would expect to see the number of residents uh, tested on a week-by-week -week basis uh, reduce because that would be uh, one of the additional indicators that the level of infection in care homes was itself reducing. The number of staff tests, of course, should uh, continue uh, because it is that iterative process. And as the First Minister said, uh, I have made very clear to our health boards who are responsible for this and directly accountable to me for it, that uh, I will see from them uh, every week, there are weekly plans about what they have done in the previous week in terms of testing of the care home workers and care home residents where it's appropriate to test the residents in all the care homes in their board area and what they plan to do for the following week. And that is the data that, uh, with increasing validation and improvement, we will be publishing on a weekly basis in order to ensure that the policy, which has been clear, is delivered and we now have some additional resource. Uh, we have the UK uh, social care portal which provides uh, some level of test kits. That has now uh, uh, increased in its number which uh, assists uh, the speed with which 
this work can be done. But of course, boards will uh, supplement that with their own testing capacity, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the majority of, in fact, all of our mainland boards now have uh, direct testing capacity, including the processing of those tests. And we have satellite arrangements for our island boards. So we take this very seriously indeed. It is important, particularly for care home workers, that they have the assurance of uh, whether or not they are positive for the virus, in which case they will be isolating at home and where they have problems in terms of their terms and conditions. Of course, we have stepped in to alleviate those problems, uh, but also to know that as they go into a care home, they have a negative test and therefore they can continue to provide the significant quality of care for residents that they do provide. As we see this making continued progress, then uh, we will look at what more we can do to assist residents and care homes in uh, how residents are looked after. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hello, good afternoon. Um, just to continue on the, the same issue, I mean, some in the care home sec sector are petrified at the prospect of a, a second wave of this, this virus. And they really feel that you aren't learning from mistakes that have already been made, particularly on the issue of testing. Um, it, it seems from today and recent days that you're you're very much blaming health boards for failing to deliver on the promise that you've you've made on testing. Um, but a lot of these health boards are under special measures. They're subject to Scottish government scrutiny. Why why is it that they are failing to deliver on your promise? And how long is it going to take before we get to the stage where there's weekly testing of all care home staff? Well, let me be very clear, which I think I've been uh, repeatedly. I'm not blaming anybody. I think people who've watched uh, these updates on a daily basis, uh, any reasonable minded person will conclude I've, I've never stood here and blamed anybody. Ultimately, as First Minister, I'm responsible for a response to this uh, virus. But it is a, a statement of fact that in practice, it is health boards who have to deliver uh, the testing programme. So we work with health boards. Uh, we make sure they've got the resources. And if there are issues with the resources, uh, they know they can come to us and we resolve that. Uh, but we need to have these partnerships working effectively. And you know, as I've said before, not to blame them, but as a statement of fact, care home providers uh, are an important partner in the work we are doing uh, to protect care home residents as well. I think the final point I, I would make there um, is just what, what has occurred in care homes, not just in Scotland, but uh, in many, many countries across the globe in the course of this uh, pandemic has been uh, undoubtedly the most upsetting um, aspect of a very upsetting uh, crisis that we've all lived through. And that is uh, the case for all of us, but for nobody more so than uh, those in care homes, those working in care homes, and of course the relatives of those uh, who have died in care homes. Um, so I'm, I'm not seeking in any way to, to take away from that reality. But we have a situation in care homes now where we see the number of care homes that have an outbreak of COVID-19 declining. Uh, we see the number of people dying in care homes declining now, thankfully, very rapidly. So what that says is not that there's no more work to be done, but what that says is that the package of measures of which testing is, is only one of those measures that we have been putting in place is having uh, the effect that we want these measures to have. And for those who understandably are worried, we are all concerned about the prospect of a second wave of this virus, uh, that we should take some assurance uh, for the fact that these measures that we are putting in place are driving down uh, the virus in care homes right now. And we will continue to make sure not only that we implement the measures we expect to be implemented right now, but continue to listen to advice and evidence about further steps that we are able to take. Chris Musson from The Sun. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Mister. Um, just going back to Glenn Campbell's question on Boris Johnson's uh, support bubbles for couples. In answer, you said that you'd stick to our plan and mention the plan move to phase two next week. But in your route map, the relevant phase two measure says meeting people from another household indoors with physical distancing and hygiene measures. And indeed, that physical distancing indoors element remains in phase three too. So can we rule out couples getting back together until phase four? Or are you 
considering separate guidance still, as you've previously suggested? Well, as you will uh, recall when we set out the route map, a, a route map is the indicative uh, phasing and the steps mm. we will seek to take within each phase. Um, it can't cover every eventuality and I was very clear when we set out the route map that there's a lot of detail that lies underneath that that we have to consider uh, as we go. So we are considering uh, all sorts of uh, different points of detail that lie under the, the broad uh, kind of categories we set out in the route map and that will involve, you know, I've talked about construction today, so we have a phasing in our route map for construction but the construction industry itself has its own restart plan that within our phasing it is being operationalised. So there will be more detailed bits of guidance that lie uh, underneath the headlines of the route map. That's what makes some of these uh, decisions so uh, very intricate and, and complex and we are considering all of the different things we've got to balance here, I was very clear as we went into phase one uh, that we couldn't, and remember the context here, we've got, even now when we see uh, the data going so firmly in the right direction, uh, we, we still have limited headroom to change things before we risk the R number rising and the virus going out of control again. In phase one, I was very clear we shouldn't uh, spend, for want of a better word, all of that headroom just on uh, however important it is getting the economy going, we had to recognise people's need for social interaction and family and friends contact as well. And, and getting that balance right will continue to be important. So I'm not going to stand here a week out from the review and randomly uh, announce things that might or might not happen. But we will take a very considered uh, approach to whether we go into phase two and what going into phase two means. And there will be uh, some things that we might not be able to do. Uh, at uh, the, the immediate point of phase two, there may be a phasing within phase two, there may be some things that require greater guidance, but getting all of those decisions right and recognising the reality of how people are living their lives right now and trying to come to a view on what will make the biggest difference to people's quality of life. And, and that will be a balance of getting the economy back together to try to mitigate some of the fears people have about job losses, but also enabling people uh, to come uh, into contact with each other a bit more and get that quality of personal life back as well. So we'll, we'll continue to do that in a, a considered way and reach judgments that then I'll stand uh, here. Well, I won't stand here. I'll be in Parliament next Thursday, setting out the conclusions we've reached and the rationale uh, for them. Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, so Tom Hunter uh, yesterday called for the two metre rule to be reviewed straight away. He warned that if it's kept in place that the furlough scheme could end up being a bridge to mass unemployment. Um, both he and Andrew Wilson have warned that mass unemployment could end up causing more deaths than COVID via poverty. And Mr Wilson on the television last night said that if other countries are moving towards a lower limit, we will have to move towards it because many businesses, tourism businesses, hospitality are telling us at two metres they will fail. It just won't work and jobs will be lost. I just wanted to get your reaction to those comments and whether you think that the two metre rule is, is sustainable. I don't know if you were on the call earlier on, but I gave a very lengthy answer and then Gregor gave a lengthy answer to Glenn Campbell. So I'm, not, I'm going to try not to repeat everything I've already uh, said. But I, and this is not a comment directed at Tom or Andrew or any individual, I know why people are making this argument, because everybody desperately wants to see businesses operational in as conducive a way as possible to get back to normal. But I, I really think people have to stop seeing this two metre versus one metre as almost some totem or ideological uh, position. As I said earlier on, these are difficult judgments and there are no absolutes in this. So we know that the risk of transmission at two metres is less than it is at one metre the risk of transmission at three or four metres would be less than it is at two metres. So you have to come to a judgment and you have to understand the trade-offs. So if you go from two metres to one metre in a, a, you know, a crowded place, then part of the trade-off would be you, you would have to wear a face covering or you could spend less time within that, that distance. So we have to come to consider judgments about this. And remember, coming back to the basic point here, I want to get the economy going uh, as quickly as possible and I want to get it going in a way that is as close to normal as possible as quickly as possible but if the consequence of doing that is that this virus spreads again and more people start dying and we have to lock down again that is not helping the businesses that are arguing for uh, a change to this so we we have to consider the evidence carefully uh, 
the advice that's been given to me right now would, is that we shouldn't change the two metres. And if I was to act against that advice, I'd no doubt have the Daily Telegraph and others uh, asking me why I thought I knew better than the experts who were giving me the advice. But we have to take, as our very first uh, paper uh, set out, we have to balance all of the different harms here. And we will keep trying to come to the right judgments um, and we will keep reviewing the decisions we are making so that we are taking account of the best evidence at the different stages of dealing with this epidemic. Uh, Seth Carell from The Guardian. Yeah, good afternoon, First Minister. Can I just um, go back to the responses you gave to Glenn Campbell and to Chris Musson? Um, I believe that you were the first UK government leader to use the word social bubble when you spoke about the Belgian bubble on the 24th of April, but you now seem to be um, stepping away from that quite carefully. You haven't used the concept of a bubble for quite some time. Are you now hinting to us that when you announce next Thursday the next phase of easing the lockdown, that the concept of a bubble where two families or two households can be much closer together has now been dropped from your planning for the time being. Uh, no. And can I just say, I'm not going to uh, proceed through this uh, pandemic by hinting at things. When I've got something to say, I'm going to say it. Um, I've not taken the approach during this uh, that politicians would take during normal times or an election campaign of briefing the newspapers in advance or of giving you a nod and a wink. I've stood here at this platform and announced decisions and that's what I'm going to continue to do. So you can't read anything one way or the other into what I'm saying today because we're still in the process of reviewing the evidence. We did talk about a bubble before as we went into phase one. The advice was it was better to do what we have done, allow people to meet uh, one other household outdoors and not limit it to just one household, but to emphasise the outdoors and the overall numbers as we go forward, we will look at the evidence and if we can do that in a way that allows people to uh, meet people differently, we will do that. So I'm not hinting anything, I'm not giving you a nod and a wink about anything, I'm just doing the really old fashioned uh, traditional uh, or perhaps not traditional thing of a politician saying I'm just going to take the methodical, systemic, uh, careful, uh, weighing up all the evidence and trying to come to the best decisions I can uh, through this. So uh, don't treat this as if it's a kind of normal nods, winks, briefings in advance. I'm just trying to be as open and frank with people as I can be, and we haven't come to these decisions yet. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thank you very much, First Minister. On the um, resumption of construction work, does that mean that there are any paused government infrastructure projects that can now be resumed as a result of this change? That may very well be the case, but I, I don't have a list of uh, these projects in front of me, so we can give you some detail on that uh, later on, if that would be helpful. Um, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, good afternoon, First Minister. Could I just briefly follow up on these questions on the social bubble? Is I mean, what comfort is can you give to the likes of grandparents wanting to hug their grandkids again, or lovers living separately, who might be looking rather enviously on at the bubble proposals south of the border after, you know, 12 weeks of, you know, lack of physical contact. Is there any comfort at all you can give to people? Well, I'm not just going to start repeating myself for the sake of repeating myself. I've, I've answered this fairly uh, extensively now. Um, and so the comfort I will give is that a week today, um, I will stand in Parliament and outline the conclusions we've reached about going into phase two, whether we think we can do that and if we can, to what extent and what that means in terms of, of living, uh, lifting further lockdown measures. I'm very hopeful we will be able to take some significant steps forward next week. But the other comfort I will give, um, and I don't expect people to, you know, sort of... Uh, be delighted about any of this because I, I totally understand the frustrations people are, are living with but what I'm trying to do is make changes and take decisions in a way that gives people as much of their uh, lives back as quickly as possible but protects us from this virus and we can't take our eye off that ball so that's why I'm trying to do things really carefully. Believe me the easiest thing in the world would be for me to stand here day in and day out or once a week uh, if I was only doing this once a week and say because I'm standing here, I need to announce something that I'm, I'm going to do for lifting lockdown. But it wouldn't be sensible because, you know, 
a few weeks from now or a couple of weeks from now, I might have to say, do you know what, that wasn't the most sensible thing to do because I hadn't thought it through properly, so I'm going to have to go back the way. So uh, call me boring if you want, but I'm going to stick to the plan here to try to get Scotland through this as as safely and as sustainably as possible. And if sometimes that means doing things a little bit slower than people understandably want, then please at least know it's for a good reason. Uh, I've said all along, this is not a popularity contest. My fundamental duty as First Minister right now is to the best of my ability is to steer this country as safely as I can through the biggest crisis any of us have ever lived through. And that's what I'm going to continue to focus on every day. Uh, Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, it's already been mentioned, but uh, all, it's been reported this morning that all 2,299 people in McDonald's hotels have been consulted on redundancies. This potentially could have a huge impact on the north of Scotland. There's still a number of weeks before the tourism industry restarts. Can I ask you what, what can you do now? And yesterday, Fergus Ewing um, suggested that there might be support for the Highland Wildlife Park, which is said to be heading towards extinction, in inverted commas. Are you able to give us any more details on that? I, I'm not able to give any more details on that uh, right now, but as Fergus said yesterday, that, as, as well as many other things, are, are under uh, consideration. Um, but the, the fundamental point I, I, I need to make, the reason we gave an indicative start date for tourism yesterday was to allow... Uh, businesses in the tourism sector to start to plan and to take bookings and, and to, to start to, to see light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, hopefully, that you know, whether it's McDonald's Hotels or any other uh, hotel chain or, or business in the tourist sector that are suffering such uh, severe challenges right now, that will be helpful, uh, not in getting them back to normal straight away, but in giving them a, a planning horizon uh, that they can start to, to look towards. So I very much hope and we are absolutely focused on trying to uh, get through this in a way and at a pace that mitigates the kind of job losses that we are uh, hearing consult being consulted about right now but I come back to my central point here um, we have to do this safely we have to do it in the right way and at the right pace because if we take a, a misstep on this we send everybody back the way and that would be disastrous so we will continue to do this as we uh, as and when we can we will speed it up and I, I desperately want to speed this up as much as possible but not to the extent that we risk it all going backwards and uh, you know these these decisions are not going to get any easier but they become more vital to get right with every day that passes. Vivian Aitken from the record. Sorry about that, First Minister. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to ask you about childcare provision for key workers and ask why it varies so much from council to council. Um, an example I'll give you, a, a mum and dad, both nurses, live in South Lanarkshire, where provision is just nine to three, um, which is far short of their need as they work 12-hour hospital shifts. Before COVID, they would rely on breakfast clubs, after-school clubs, help from family and friends, but none of this is currently open to them. Mum works in ICU, dad in HDU, so they're frontline workers. Um, friends of theirs who are single parents have been forced to breach the guidelines to ask grandparents to help out as they actually have no other option. But a neighbouring council offers eight to eight cover and some large city councils are providing eight to six cover. So why has there been allowed to be such a variation when our healthcare workers uh, need our practical support more than ever and will the Scottish Government step in to alleviate matters to help during the school summer holidays? Well, we work very closely with local authorities but in a uh, short answer to your central question there, uh, why is this local authority determined? It's because education childcare is the statutory responsibility of local authorities and they uh, make these decisions based on their local circumstances and needs but we have been working closely with them to make sure there is the childcare that uh, children of key workers but also vulnerable children need. We have had a hub provision right throughout this crisis. Uh, part of the phase one changes is to increase the availability of uh, critical childcare um, and we've also indicated that will run through the summer and the Deputy First Minister 
chairs the Education Recovery Group, which is looking at all of these issues on an ongoing basis. We're also currently looking at things like free school meal provision over the summer because we recognise there will be a need for uh, support like that. So uh, these are local government responsibilities. In normal times, usually I'm getting criticised for us uh, not allowing local decision making of, of local councils. But in a time like this, it's important that we seek to coordinate that as much as possible. And that's what we have been doing. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. The Courier reported today that 70,000 COVID-19 test results from UK-run regional test centres in Scotland still have not been published. The UK government says it's been sending this information to Holyrood for weeks, and almost a month ago you said the results would be available within a matter of days. Are you able to say, please, why this information still hasn't been published, and can you give a specific date for when it will be? Um, well, the information has been published. Um, so it's actually 72,408 uh, tests of, as of today have gone through the, the UK-wide systems, the drive-through centres. That information on a, has been published uh, on a daily basis. What has not yet been possible is to break it down into positive and negative in the way we do with uh, the, the results coming through our own NHS lab uh, framework. And that's because we haven't until recently had the data of a, of a quality and in a form that we can do that. We are now very close. I would hope in uh, literally a day or two to be able to publish that daily alongside uh, the information we currently publish about uh, test results coming through NHS labs. But this, the, the, the number of tests are published on a daily basis. I should also say the information is published, uh, so the Scottish number will be published as part of the UK number every day, uh, and that is broken down into positive and negative, but it's not disaggregated for Scotland. So, so the, the information is published. It's also now going through Test and Protect. Uh, so all of this uh, information is there. But that positive, negative, I would hope, uh, possibly, I, I can't give an absolute guarantee on this yet because we're still doing uh, final quality checks on this. But I would hope even as early as tomorrow, we can start to uh, publish that breakdown. But just to be clear, the, the numbers have been published and have been published uh, for some time. Terry Murden from the Daily Business Group. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, can I just follow up on the proposed date for reopening the uh, tourism sector? Um, could you clarify the position with retail, particularly as many uh, tourism businesses are retailers uh, or include retail in their operations, such as gift shops? Um, are you making a distinction here and how will you do that? For instance, would you define a, a small um, art gallery or a craft workshop as a tourism business, but not a high street stationer or greetings card shop selling the same sort of items? Forward, the figure soon covered some of this. Obviously, there will be guidance and uh, you know sort of safety guidance as well as broader guidance for the the sector. But but retail in, in the route map, retail is. Uh, Although in all of these things, it goes back to a point I made earlier, the route map is a very high level document uh, and we distinguish between retail and uh, tourism. But of course, there are overlaps there. I hope to say more um, about retail uh, when we give the update uh, next Thursday, but we haven't taken those decisions yet. So I, I will not say more about it right now, uh, but I will say more about that uh, as we decide the, the phase two uh, decision next week. Muir Dickey from the Financial Times. Thank you. Uh, Professor Neil Ferguson said that if we, if the UK had uh, started lockdown a week earlier, less than half as many people would have died. Uh, what, if anything, have you taken from experience of being part of that decision that uh, changes the way you, you look at how we come out of lockdown? And a quick one for Dr Smith, if I might. Uh, the data today shows that our estimate for the R number in Scotland is substantially over 0 0.5, but we're expecting the number of infectious cases to fall by more than half uh, in the two weeks to June 19th. Uh, could you give a kind of layman's explanation of how those two things can be true? Thank you. Um, I'll definitely hand over to the Chief Medical Officer on that uh, second part of your question. On the first part of the question, I mean, I, I, I listened to Professor Ferguson yesterday, and I think, you know, to be fair to him, he was not. Uh, he was being pretty candid that he was seeking to apply hindsight. This was not something that you know had been advised at the time. I mean, I'm. I I think it is undoubtedly the case that when we come to look back on uh, the things that were done and not done, then because, uh, well, firstly, there will have been mistakes made, straightforward mistakes. And I think it's really important to be candid about that. 
we haven't yet done the, the look back in a sort of detailed enough way for me to stand here right now and tell you what all those mistakes were and why they were made. But I think in the fullness of time, that's really important. But there will also be things that had we known then what we know now, we might have done differently, but you don't have the hindsight when you make the decisions. But again, for learning for the future, that will be really important. Uh, one of the things, and I've, I've talked about this here before, but also, you know, it's, it's obvious in, in all of our decision making right now. Um, one of the things at a reasonably early stage we took the decision to do uh, was to establish the Chief Medical Officers Advisory Group uh, so that we had an additional source of scientific advice that was very much hooked into SAGE but was uh, direct to the Scottish Government with the ability to translate the SAGE advice into particular Scottish circumstances. And in terms of, um, I, I suppose, the my ability now coming out of lockdown to make sure that our decisions are very tailored for Scotland, um, then that was an important development to give us the underpinning advice that we, we need in order to do that with confidence. Uh, Gregor. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, actually. And uh, whilst I don't pretend to understand all the intricacies of what's a very complex mathematical model that predicts uh, both the R number itself, but also starts to model the, um, the, the, the kind of cases that lie ahead. One of the things that we've got to factor into that is actually the what has previously been termed the, the, the kind of doubling time uh, for, for the uh, virus and how that has gradually stretched out over time. And I think perhaps um, the best way that I could uh, try to get you an accurate answer to that is to ask the chief statis uh, statistician uh, to be in touch with you to, to kind of explain exactly uh, why we're seeing this pattern in, in the, the data that you've described. So I pass it on to the chief medical officer who has expertly passed it on rightly, I should say, to the chief statistician, but we will give you a technical answer uh, to that question as soon as possible. Um, and lastly today, Tom Gordon from the Herald. Hello, First Minister. Hi there. Uh, can I just take you back to the data on the testing of care home staff that was, came out yesterday? Now, you told Parliament it was about 15,000 in total. That was later revised up to about 18,000. It later emerged that that data includes four weeks of material from before the policy even being announced. It dates back to April 20th, but the policy was only announced on May 18th. Why was that data bulked out with four weeks of historic data before the policy existed, except for presentational reasons? Um, and now that it's running at about 2,500 tests per week, and it should be over 50,000, why should people have any faith that this policy will be delivered, given the numbers are so low? Actually, we, we also give uh, the most recent week uh, of data, but in terms of, we give a cumulative total of the numbers of residents and staff who had been tested, because if your interest here is in how many have been tested, then surely that is the relevant number, how many staff and residents have been tested. Um, and actually, uh, I, I gave an underestimate in Parliament yesterday. Um, you know, I think if I'd given an overestimate, the criticism, uh, might be a bit more valid, but I actually underestimated how many tests had been done because there was an administrative error in the figure from Greater Glasgow in Clyde, which was corrected last night. So there actually were more tests have been done than I reported in Parliament. Um, so we are uh, we will publish this data every week, so you will be able to assess the changes in it week on week, um, and that is what will. Uh, be used for uh, myself and the health secretary to scrutinise the progress that were being made, that is being made. But it will also allow both the media and the wider public who can go on and look at this data to see the progress that is being made. Um, so there's complete transparency around this information, as I think people have a right to expect. Uh, Jean, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think that covers it, First Minister. The weekly uh, data is the the data that we will be scrutinising, as others will, to ensure that the policy is being implemented, particularly with respect to care home workers, where we've said that all care home workers will be tested and those who are returning negative tests will be tested again uh, in that seven day period. Uh, and as I said earlier, I expect to see uh, and hope to see the number of residents tested week on week coming down because 
the measures that have been introduced and the work of care home staff begins to bear fruit in preventing the virus from catching hold in a care home and uh, transmitting from one resident to another. So that weekly data uh, will be important. The cumulative data uh, does show uh, all of the testing that has been done uh, in care homes uh, for both staff and residents uh, and obviously shows that that was being undertaken in advance of the policy that was announced and that is a positive step. And again, without uh, in any way, shape or form minimising the, the tragedy that has unfolded in care homes, not just in Scotland, but in many countries, uh, the actions that have been taken are reducing transmission in care homes and thankfully reducing the number of people who are losing their lives. So in care homes, as in the uh, country overall, the collective actions that we are taking has got this virus in retreat, but to keep it in retreat and to keep it uh, reducing and to keep the, the impact of it uh, reducing, we all need to keep doing these things. That means government working with health boards and care home providers need to keep doing the right things in care homes, but it means all of us as citizens need to keep doing the right things to make sure that we uh, continue with the suppression of the virus. So can I thank you for joining us today. Thank you uh, to the journalists for joining us. My thanks to Gregor and Jean and to Robert, our BSL interpreter uh, today. Um, please keep sticking to the guidelines so that we keep making the progress that we've been able to report today. Um, I'll be back here with you tomorrow at 12.30, but in the meantime, thanks for joining us.